What is your greatest need? An exhausted mom here today might say, ooh, my greatest need is a vacation. Given the way inflation is these days, a lot of us might say, I need a raise. We might say more serious things like, I need to get out of debt. Or I need to forgive that person who wronged me. Or I need freedom from addiction or depression or anxiety. All of those are real needs. Having them changed and met could change your life, but they are not your greatest need. There are other things that we need for happy, healthy, productive lives. For instance, we need good sleep. Uh, That's why we have chamomile tea and melatonin and prescription sleep aids and CPAPs and fluffy pillows and whatever else you use to try to get a good night's sleep. We need exercise. That's why we have gym memberships, play sports, walk, run, work in our yards, do other things just to keep our bodies active and agile. We need healthy food. That's why we try to eat a balanced diet. It's why some people drink wheatgrass shakes and eat kale salad. Reminds me of the old couple. They were 110, died at the same time, went to heaven. They walked into heaven and and they immediately saw the beautiful banquet tables prepared. And the, the wife said, man, isn't heaven wonderful? The husband said, yes, it is. And if you'd not switched me from fried chicken to kale salad 50 years ago, we would have gotten here sooner. <laughs> we need all kind of things, don't we, to live good healthy lives. There are things that we need to do that, to stay healthy, to enjoy life. But none of those are our greatest need. Our greatest need is Jesus. And we need Him more than we know. Whether you're already a believer or not yet a believer, you need Jesus more than you know. Interestingly, you need Jesus has become an urban expression. It's found in memes like on the screen here. And it's become a sort of comeback or a cut down even to a mess up or a messed up life. You need Jesus. Well, even the secular world, which might not believe in Jesus and certainly doesn't follow Jesus, knows that Jesus can help if your life is off the rails. But you see, you need Jesus is more than a cut down or a comeback. You need Jesus is a fundamental fact. You and I need Jesus more than we know. Now, maybe you you don't believe you need Jesus. Maybe you feel like Jesus is just a crutch that some people use. And you don't need a crutch. Well, can I just tell you, you... And those people who think Jesus is just a crutch need Jesus more than you know. Or maybe you say, well, you know, I need Jesus, but I just need him a little bit. You know, he's good in a pinch when I've got a problem. He's good to forgive sin when I need that. He's good to comfort me when I'm down. He's good to help out when I've got a problem. And that's great. I'm glad you depend on Jesus some, but can I tell you you need Jesus more than you know? Now, some of you might be here and you say, well, well, I know that I need Jesus. I absolutely need Jesus. And, and that's great. I would almost give you permission to take a nap today. But I would encourage somebody, amen that. <laughs> Over here somewhere. So y'all get your elbows ready. How's Lily doing today? She, she falls asleep every day. She's out? Okay, good, good. Glad I did my job. <laughs> I'd almost give you permission to take a nap if you say, well, I need Jesus. Well, but let me remind you today that that you really do need Jesus more than you realize. For most of us, our knowledge of our need of Jesus falls, as somebody said, pitifully short of reality. And so my prayer is that all of us will leave here today knowing how much we need Jesus and determined to grab hold of him and to not let go and to grow in him each day. Some of you may need to be saved this morning. You need to get to know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior and allow him to transform your life. 
Uh, others of you may profess to be Christians, but you know that you're not living as you should. And, and so there's some things you need to repent of and you need to come back to the Lord. You need to rededicate your life to him. Or, or maybe you just know you're living in disobedience. Maybe, maybe you're not necessarily doing anything you're not supposed to do. You're just not doing the thing or things you know you should do. And so repent and come back to the Lord today. All of us need to get to know Jesus more because we need him more than we know. So I invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word today to Genesis chapter 1. We're talking about our need for Jesus today, yet we're turning to the first book of the Old Testament. That may seem odd, but it's all the more reason you should listen. Genesis 1 is the account of creation, or at least the first part of the account of the creation. And if you get Genesis correct, you get the rest of the Bible correct. If you get Genesis wrong, you get the rest of the Bible wrong. That's because if God is not the creator, then he cannot be the redeemer of that creation. If there was not one man, Adam, who sinned, bringing sin to all the world, then there cannot be the one man, the God-man, Jesus, the second Adam, who then brings redemption to the entire world. You must believe Jesus in order to believe and get and understand the rest of the Bible. You especially must believe Genesis 1. And so we come to this chapter, this first chapter in Genesis, to realize our need for Jesus. But it's before Adam and Eve's names are even mentioned. It's before sin even enters the world. It's before Satan's even enters, enters, enters into the story. But right here in the story of creation, when everything is still very good, we find our need for Jesus. We begin in verse 1, one of the most important, if not the most important verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I say it's important because that verse sets the stage for the entire Bible. It tells us that the earth and the heavens had a beginning, that God pre-existed that beginning, and that God created everything in the physical realm that we see and that we touch from the dirt under our feet to the stars in the sky. And so as we journey through this rather familiar chapter in these six days of creation, I want you to notice two patterns that God established. I was put into the, onto this by an article a couple of weeks ago, and it just really stopped me in my tracks. Two patterns got established in the creation account. In the creation account, certain things are meant to be separated while other things are meant to be united. And I want us to look first at the pattern of separation, beginning in verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So first, on day one, God created light. He then separated light from darkness. Then on day two, God created the sky. He then separated the water in the sky from the water on the earth. Then on day three, God separated the water on the earth from the dry ground. But there was more separation still to come. Look down at verses 14 and following. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So here we find on day four, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
They were meant to separate day from night and to mark off the days and the seasons and the months and the years and so forth. More separation. Prior to their moon landing on July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 astronauts took this photo of the earth. You can see everything in this photo that we just said. Notice how clearly light is separated from darkness. While part of the world is experiencing day, the other side of the world is experiencing night. You can see the waters in the sky and the clouds separated from the waters in the seas, lakes, oceans below. You can see the land separated from the waters. Every piece of separation that God created in the beginning is there in this picture that was taken tens of thousands of years after creation in the midst of a space race during a scientific age. Isn't it amazing that still today we can prove what Genesis 1 says just with our naked eye? We give praise to God for that. Well, as we look at the account of creation, we find these four separate areas, the outer space, the sky, the atmosphere of the earth, water, and land. All were uniquely created by God for a purpose. They were also all separated by God so that they might fulfill their purpose. Separation is one pattern of creation. But there's another that I want us to see today, and that is the pattern of essential unity. In each of these separate realms, and especially in the realms that we see on earth, and that's where we're going to focus today, in the realms of the atmosphere, the sky, the land, and the sea, there are things created to dwell within those realms. And those creations and their realm are essentially united. If they are separated, they die. But if they are united, they thrive. First, we see this pattern of essential unity in plants and trees. Look at back at verse 11. God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. Notice that God spoke land uh, or plants and trees into being by saying, let the earth produce. Therefore, for plants and trees to live and be fruitful, they must remain connected to the earth. There is an essential unity between the ground and plants. From time to time here in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, we'll have beautiful flower arrangements. They're almost as big as this pulpit. And they're expensive and they're beautiful. But let me tell you what happens to those flower arrangements by the end of the week. They wilt and they die. It doesn't matter what temperature the room is kept. It doesn't matter how often you change the water. It doesn't matter what you put in the water. Those flowers will go from gorgeous to garbage in a week's time. Why? Because they have been cut off from the land with which they are essentially united. Now consider the realms of water and sky. Verses 20 and following. God said, let the water Team with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So God speaks the living creatures of the earth's waters into being by saying, let the waters team with living creatures. He then speaks the birds into existence with a similar saying with let birds fly over the earth across the expanse of the sky. A fish out of water is a fish that will die. A bird that is meant to fly but has no sky is unable to hunt or it's unable to catch food and so it will die. Fish are essentially united with water. Birds are essentially united with the sky. Now let's consider the realm of the land again down in verse 24. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creatures that move along the ground, wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. Once again, God speaks into existence 
by, uh, speaks these things into existence by giving them essential unity with something else. Here, God speaks living creatures, the livestock, creatures that crawl along the ground, wild animals saying, let the land produce these creatures. So here again, essential unity is demonstrated. For living creatures to live and to be fruitful and multiply, as God said, they must remain unified with the earth. You cannot take a cow and throw it into the ocean. While cows can swim, they can't swim that long. And even if they could swim that long, there's no food in the ocean for that cow. And so that cow is going to tire out. That cow is going to drown. The, the cow is essentially united with the land. Likewise, you can't take a cat in an airplane with you and throw it out the window of the airplane at 10,000 feet. That cat cannot fly. Neither can that f- cat find anything to eat in the sky, even though it does eat birds. It'd have a hard time catching a bird on the way down. But when that cat lands, even if it lands on all fours, it's going to be a splat cat when it hits the ground. Cats cannot live in the air. Do you get the pattern of essential unity? Every created being must live essentially connected to that from which it came. When I was about an eight-year-old boy, I found a baby bird in our yard that had fallen out of a birdhouse in our, in our front yard, and, and being a compassionate eight-year-old boy or a curious eight-year-old boy, one, I grabbed that bird, I put it in a box, and I brought it inside to nurse that bird to life with all of my eight-year-old veterinary experience. You will not be surprised to learn that the bird did not make it. But as much as part of that was because I had no clue what I was doing, the biggest reason that bird didn't make it is because that bird was not where it was supposed to be. It was not supposed to be in our house on the ground. It was supposed to be in the air in that birdhouse with its mother. It was essentially connected, united to her in the sky. So the pattern is to create vegetation. God spoke to the earth. There's now essential unity between plants and the ground to create water creatures. God spoke to the water. There's now essential unity between the water creatures and the water to create birds. God spoke in a similar way to the sky and the birds were created. So there's essential unity between flying birds and the sky and then to create Animals on the earth, God spoke to the land, and there's now essential unity between the land and these animals. Now, there's one creature, though, that we haven't yet talked about, and that's us. So what about mankind? To what did God speak when he created us? Well, the pattern is still there, but it changes just a bit. Because this time, God didn't speak to a what, rather, he spoke to a Instead of speaking to the sky or water or land, other parts of creation, when God created humanity, God spoke to himself. Look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Let the land produce vegetation. Let the waters teem with living creatures. Let the skies be filled with birds. Let the land produce living creatures. But then let us make man in our image. So go back to the pattern. How much does a flower need the earth? Essential unity. Without the land, the flower dies. How much does the fish need the water? Essential unity. Without the water, the fish dies. How much does the bird need the air? Essential unity. Without the sky, the bird dies. How much does the land creature, the cow, need the land? Essential unity. Without the land, the cow dies. So then, how much do you need Jesus? Essential unity. Without Jesus, you will die. You see, you need Jesus more than you know, not just for forgiveness, not just for salvation, not just for guidance. While we definitely need him for all those things, you need Jesus for your very life. 
Let me take you now to the New Testament, Acts chapter 17. Turn over there. All the way in the New Testament, Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is in the city of Athens, Greece. The city was full of idols, and that troubled Paul. And so he began reasoning with uh, the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks and really anyone that he could find in the marketplace to try to help them understand about the true God. Well, finally, the, the philosophers in Athens were troubled by what Paul was saying. And so they actually came to him. They invited him to a meeting. And they said, look, man, you're, tr- you're teaching some strange stuff. We don't really understand it. And so could you tell us what it means? And so Paul told them. Acts chapter 17, verse 24, Paul has just noted that in Athens there was an a altar with the inscription to an unknown God. And so Paul says, hey, I know that God. Verse 24 of Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because... He himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. Notice that. Way back up in verse 25, he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Verse 28, in him we live and move and have our being. Paul takes this fundamental truth of essential unity and he shows the philosophers, look, you have all these idols But what you need is Jesus. For it is in him that we live and we move and we have our being. You need Jesus more than you know. How much do you need Jesus? Well, perhaps no one tells us as much as John in his gospel. And mostly in John's gospel through the words of Jesus himself, but not always. And so let's go on a quick little survey of the gospel of John. In John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, in that powerful prologue that begins that gospel, we read, through the word, meaning Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him, get this, was life. And that life was the light of men. So Jesus gives us life itself. You cannot live without Jesus. Now look over to John chapter 4 verse 10. Familiar story. Jesus is meeting with the Samaritan woman. He goes to that, that well and he meets with her. And he tells her that though she came to draw water... That water will never satisfy. She will be thirsty again, but Jesus tells her that anyone who drinks of him will never thirst again. We cannot live without Jesus. Now John 6, 35. Another of the I am statements of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And as Jesus told Satan, when Satan tempted him in the wilderness, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy saying, man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Here, Jesus, the living word that we learned in John chapter 1, also says that he is the bread of life so that we cannot live without Jesus. John 8 verse 12, Jesus says, I am The light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Without Jesus, we would be consumed by the sinfulness of this dark world. But Jesus is the light who penetrates the darkness, who reveals the lies of the enemy, and who brings us into life. We cannot live without Jesus. And then in John 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief comes 
only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. The devil is at work stealing and killing and destroying through his deception. In our day, more than he has in generations. He has convinced people they do not need Jesus. He has convinced people there is no absolute truth. He has convinced people that their gender is a mistake. He has convinced people that killing the unborn is right. And it goes on and on and on. He steals, he kills, he destroys. But Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You see, nothing Satan offers will give you abundant life. You can try to cover up or excuse your sin and you will never be rid of it and you will never be at peace. Uh, You can seek solace in the darkness, but you will never feel safe. Satan brings destructive life and latent anger, but Jesus brings abundant life and abiding joy. The contrasts are as different as night and day. Because of Jesus, a person can have joy despite circumstances. Because of Jesus, we can have abundant life. We cannot live without Jesus. In John 14, 6, Jesus adds, the disciples were stressed about Jesus leaving them. Jesus says, you know the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We need to know the way to heaven. Jesus is the way. We need to be able to discern truth from lies. Jesus is the truth. We need life. Jesus is life. We cannot live without Jesus. Now, if you haven't gotten it by now in this little journey through John's gospel, just turn over to John 15, verse 5, where Jesus makes our need for him abundantly clear with a classic illustration when he says, I am the vine... You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Whenever a branch abides in the vine, there's that essential unity that happens. And it abounds because of the vine. But if that vine, if that branch is cut off the vine, it dies. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But the reverse is also true here, what Jesus says in John 15, 5, without Jesus, you can do nothing. I can do all things with Christ. I can do nothing without Christ. Uh, Jesus takes a life of obedience, and he causes it to bear fruit wherever he plants it. We cannot live without Jesus. We have an essential unity with Jesus. Without him, we die. With him, We live abundantly, as abundantly as a lush forest that's connected to the ground, as abundantly as a a school of fish swimming in the sea who are connected to one another, as abundantly as a flock of birds flying in the sky who are essentially united with their habitat, as essentially united and beautiful as a flock of sheep grazing on a hillside. That is abundant life. So the question today is, do you have abundant life? Maybe you would say, eh, life's okay. Eh, life's here. I mean, I'm not miserable. I'm, I'm okay. But abundant? Eh, not really. So why is that? It's because you're missing that essential unity with Jesus. If you don't have abundant life, then you're not thriving. You are dying. Because in life, we're either thriving or we're dying. And we want to be thriving in our spiritual life. So maybe you would admit that even though you're a Christian, you've, you've drifted from Jesus. It's easy to do. I mean, life is busy. Things, we drop our quiet times. We, we let other things get in the way. We miss a few weeks of church. And before we know it, we're out of habit and, and we've drifted from God. It's easy to happen. But then is there any wonder if you've drifted from God that you're stressed out, you're anxious, you're addicted, you're bound up in sin or whatever else is going on? It's because you're trying to find essential unity in something else. You're like that cow in the ocean. You're like that cat 
falling from the sky. You're not where you're supposed to be. And you can't live like that. And so I would encourage you today to repent of the stuff that's drawn you away from God. To put it down and to come back to Him. And to have that essential unity with the one who spoke you into existence. Come back to Him. Find that joy. Have that life everlasting. Rededicate your life to Jesus today. Now others in this room watching online may be uh, lacking abundant life because you've never welcomed Jesus into your life as your Savior and Lord. You're, you're literally trying to do life all on your own, and that doesn't work either. We need Jesus more than we know. And so my encouragement to you is, is, is would you come back to him? Jesus has the power to bring about a transformation that you would never believe. Yesterday at the LeCount campus, we buried a lady named Becky Weingert. Uh, Miss Becky was a a little old lady, a little bit different in in her aspect um, of life, but she was a vibrant, passionate person for the Lord. She handed out tracts. She gave people Bibles. Everybody had a tract. Everybody had a Bible or a book for Miss Becky. But we found out yesterday, we learned the rest of her story. That is, she wasn't saved until about 2015. She had lived a horrible life. She had been uh, addicted to alcohol. She had had a uh, couple of abusive husbands. Terrible, terrible life. Far, far from God. But at the bottom of the bottom, she was watching or listening to a, a John MacArthur sermon. And the Lord got a hold of her. And she wept and she cried and she repented. And the Lord broke her spirit. And it was about a week and she listened to another sermon from, from someone else. And, and that grew her. And she was saved. She was baptized at the LeCount campus, campus back in 2015. And since then, it's been a fireball for Jesus. When she was uh, declining in the nursing home a few weeks ago, I, I saw her. And, and she, just in a brief visit, she gave me her testimony in 18 words. This was it. She said, I was a reprobate. I gave as much as I got, but he lifted me. And then she shook her head and smiled, and she said, he lifted me. Eighteen words of transformation. I don't care how close you are or how far away you are. Whatever you need to get with Jesus today, he can do it. If you will come to him in repentance and faith and say, I need you, Jesus. Would you today, right now, make this declaration? We're going to pull it up on the screen. Just something I felt the Lord pointed me to this week. A declaration. I need Jesus more than I know. I will not live another minute without a life-giving connection with him. Therefore, today, and you pick which one replies to you, I come to him for salvation. I return to him in rededication or I continue to live with him in dedication. I need you, Jesus. Would you make that declaration today in your life? Would you make that declaration so that when we all walk out here today, we will be committed like never before, and we can see him work in our lives like never before?